Well, hello, everyone. Uh, good afternoon or good morning uh, whenever you're listening to this. My name is Cheryl Stenstrom. And along with Dr. Sue Allman and Dr. Deborah Hicks, I co-chair the uh, iSchool's Leadership and Management Program Advisory Committee. I'd like to welcome you to our first committee webinar. So I'm going to say a few words about the session, then I'll introduce our speakers, and then we'll get started with our main content. So this committee is representative of a wide variety of information professionals. Um, it meets twice a year to help ensure the um, curriculum offerings at the iSchool are relevant and current for iSchool students. And several years ago, the committee recommended that we invite leaders in our field to participate in a series of uh, webinars, which we've called A Day in the Life of a Leader. So you can find recordings for each of those webinars on the iSchool's website. During our last uh, um, meeting, um, our semi-annual meeting, we noted that the information being discussed was not only useful to us for planning purposes, but would be invaluable to students in the Info 204 course and any of the other uh, management course uh, offerings at the iSchool. So taking a page from the webinar series, our committee members have very graciously agreed to join us today to record their thoughts and ideas on the um, main leadership and management trends that they're seeing in the field. So with that, I just want to very briefly introduce the speakers and then we'll move into the main part of our recording. We have several questions for um, uh, already prepared uh, and each speaker will take a few minutes to address each one. And as you view this recording, please take the time to pause the webinar and read the full biography of each uh, committee member. So in alphabetical order, our committee members are Dr. Amanda Folk, who is an assistant professor and the head of teaching and learning at Ohio State uh, University Libraries. Del uh, pardon me, Dr. Melissa Fraser Arnott, who is the chief of integrated library services at the Library of Parliament in Ottawa, Canada. Mary Nino, uh, she's the former associate dean of the King Library at San Jose State University. Kelvin Watson, who is the director of libraries at Broward County in Florida and Daphne Wood, who's the Director of Library Services, Planning and Engagement at the Greater Victoria Public Library on Vancouver Island, Canada. So thank you all for being here today and uh, welcome to the recording. I'm going to turn it over now to uh, my colleague, uh, Dr. Hicks, who will um, start with our uh, main questions. Thank you, Cheryl, and welcome everybody. Uh, so we're gonna start off with uh, a question that I think uh, will be of particular interest to students of Info 204, uh, which is what are some of the management and leadership process trends that you're seeing in libraries right now? And let's start with Amanda. Great, hi everyone. Um, so some of the things that I've been seeing over the past several years is the realization and this is probably happening, been happening for quite a while, but maybe it was just new to me. Um, the realization that management and leadership aren't the same thing. Hopefully you do have managers who are leaders, but hopefully you also have leaders in your organization that hold a variety of positions. So at Ohio State right now, we often use the phrase lead from where you are, reminding people that we want them to feel like they have agency, no matter what position they're in. So maybe they're managers, maybe they're not, but everybody has something to contribute. So at the same time, we're also thinking a lot about uh, participatory uh, decision-making and shared leadership. And what does it mean to have folks from across the organization participating in decisions that affect the entire organization or specific units within the organization, as well as sharing leadership and bringing those voices into the fold. Um, so I think over the past several years, I saw that at Pitt, I was at the University of Pittsburgh uh, uh, until 2016. Those were also trends that I was seeing there, but I've seen them recognized a little bit more fully over the past several years at Ohio State. Thank you. How about you, Melissa? What kind of management and leadership trends are you seeing right now? Um, I'd say very similar to what Amanda is seeing. Um, and this is sort of being reflected in the leadership styles that we're encouraging um, we're in, through, our, through management training for current managers that we're seeing, for, um, that we're hoping to develop as well as people who are on a leadership track uh, or who are assuming leadership responsibilities without being in a, a leadership, uh, a formal leadership or management position. Uh, we're recognizing the importance of involving as many people in our organizations as possible in the decision-making processes. 
um, and really in, in empowering our staff um, to, to bring forward ideas, new initiatives. And during times like these that where you've got a lot of change, um, you've got a lot of different client groups that you're serving, a lot of, a lot of change in all the subject matters that we're, that we're focusing on, it's, it's more necessary than ever to have more people involved and to feel empowered to actually speak up and propose things. Um, it strengthens organizations to have uh, more voices involved in these decision-making processes. Uh, so for individual leaders, um, you, you even as, as you know, new hires, even as recent graduates, are likely to have some leadership responsibilities. Um, so you want to think about, start thinking about leadership styles, uh, thinking about leadership styles that really are more inclusive, um, that allow, that, that involve sharing power. Um, if you're interested in management literature and, and, and leadership literature, you're looking at um, sort of participative, participatory leadership, uh, you're looking at servant leadership, um, you're looking at forms like this, we're really, really moving away from sort of the old authoritarian kind of leadership, you know, command and control type leadership, stu leadership structures. Um, and uh, you might even see organizations where, where you're going to see changes in the organizational chart. To reflect this. Um, you're going to see flatter organizational structures where decision making is really happening closer to the front lines. Excellent, thank you very much. Mary, what kind of trends are you seeing in management leadership? Well, I have to concur with Melissa and Amanda, but just on a very practical level, what I'm seeing is um, more hiring from within, which is kind of an interesting shift. Uh, that wasn't always the case. I'm also seeing, um, as was mentioned, the working of all the different types of voices from across the organization. And that's been interesting. People paired together to figure out a problem and looking at alternative solutions. Uh, that's something that's more and more happening. Um, I also see more partnering with other communities such as the business community um, and seeing what, <clears throat> excuse me, seeing what the organizations can do together. That We bring different things to the table and we typically have often the same goals, but what can we do together? So those are some of the things I'm seeing. Excellent practical is always appreciated. How about you, Calvin? What kind of uh, management leadership trends are you seeing? So some of the things that I'm seeing, um, certainly I would reiterate and concur with all of my colleagues that have already uh, had the opportunity to speak. But what I would add is we've been focusing on the trends that I'm seeing are more situational leadership uh, opportunities. So where people can have the opportunity to coach, mentor, uh, and learn from those opportunities. Also, um, more planning and thoughtful approach to uh, to opportunities, um, being flexible and able to um, and able to pivot, and um, so those will be so th those will be a additional comments that I would that I would make. Thank you, Calvin. And last but not least, is Daphne. What kind of trends are you seeing? Um, one of the things that I would like to, to highlight, uh, especially during times like these, would be the ability for leaders within organizations to move very, very quickly from concept to the execution of a new idea or a new service. So there is a, a methodology, of course, in project management and um, anyone who is, who is studying to become a, a professional librarian will encounter a lot of really good practical tools to take something from a, a concept or an idea that comes forward to something that can actually be offered and measured and uh, the value can actually be determined from, from that offering. Something that librarians need to do faster and more often than ever is to uh, building on what my colleagues have said, take the great ideas that come from anywhere. They can come from anywhere in the organization and take those ideas and give them wings. So go from creativity to innovation, meaning that the idea is made uh, in a practical sense, something that can be delivered, something that can be offered and measured, but within a very, very short time frame. So this means relearning over and over and over again. Something that, uh, something that is offered may not work the first time. There's a lot of um, 
There's a lot of experimentation, a lot of services that are offered as pilots. And if they are truly measured and truly evaluated, a lot of good learning comes out of that. So the, the leader of one initiative may in fact take a back seat and let another person lead the next version. So we're seeing a lot of iterative learning and uh, innovation within organizations. Thank you so much. Now, before we move on to the next question, I'm just going to quickly sort of wrap up what I heard everybody saying, just because uh, there were there was a lot there, and there was also a lot of sort of I for lack of a better description, some cross-pollination, I guess. So what I was hearing were trends around empowering um, everybody in the organization, whether that was through participatory leadership or servant leadership, this idea of getting great ideas from anywhere and being iterative in um, developing ideas and services moving forward. There was also this idea of inclusion, whether that was partnerships with other organizations or through participation in how the organization is run. Um, and this was for the benefit of the overall organization. The more ideas, the better, in a, in a sense. And this is tied to the idea of coaching and mentorship that Kelvin brought up, as well as this idea of flexibility, being able to move quickly and to pivot into new uh, services and innovation innovations um, and looking to, uh, as Daphne mentioned right at the end, to project management for ideas around that. So thank you guys for that. That was really wonderful. Let's move to our next question, which I suspect we're going to hear um, some different trends coming out, just given the different focus foci that you all have. But also, uh, I think we'll also hear how some of these management leadership trends play out in practice as well. So what are some of the current service trends you're seeing? And let's just reverse our order um, and we'll start with Daphne. Some of the current service trends that we're seeing in public libraries involve small scale pilots and experimental services that initially um, surprise people that uh, they're even finding a place in public library service delivery, but ultimately they, they may grow up to become core services. And in other cases, they may have value as as an experiment that, that maybe didn't quite realize everything that was uh, originally envisioned. The key there is recognizing that libraries are porous, that there's a lot of great ideas that are coming in from all sectors, from truly the community in which the library is, is working and in which it is serving, so that this cross-pollination -pollin of ideas and concepts usually turns into some, some surprising things. I think, um, let's go back even to the concept of the library of things. Um, let's go back even further generations ago to the concept that the library would be the bridge for learning throughout the summer between school years. So at, at that time, that was, um, that was a very new concept. And look at where that is now in the life cycle. So um, I think all libraries are, are currently looking at what will be the next area of investment? How can we get something quickly from idea to execution? and see if it works and see how we can learn. I love the idea of services growing up to become a core services. That's lovely. Uh, Kelvin, how about you? What kind of trends are you seeing in services? So the, what I would say um, to add on is certainly more, uh, we're doing an enhanced amount of digitization and scanning, um, thinking about leveraging our maker spaces that public libraries have already had, um, I mentioned pivoting before, so being able to pivot so that now public libraries are in the process of offering PPE, mask, or uh, offering um, the mass hooks, for example, S hooks is what we, we just delivered 150 to Broward Healthcare Center actually last week. Um, and, and just teaching those skills, I bought new sewing machines. So we're leveraging um, more again of using some basic things that people have used before, but really seeing those go, go back to those adulting home economic skills. Um, the, again, 3D scanning, printing, um, digital access, discovery, and delivery. More content that's created for our online um, duplicative of uh, what we were offering in, in person. Now we're duplicating those to be delivered online. Data analytics, 
uh, artificial intelligence and the internet of things. So really focusing on that connectivity, digital access, discovery and delivery of our, our content. That's amazing what you are doing for your local hospitals with the PPE, congratulations. Uh, so Mary, what kind of trends are you seeing these days? I think uh, education is really key. Um, we've always done, you know, tutoring and various one-shot programs, but I see that becoming more and more part of the library's core purpose. Uh, some libraries across the country now, you can get your high school diploma through the library. Um, we have enough ESL requests or um, immigrants coming in wanting to learn language. We're looking at that. How can we better do that? And it could possibly be that at the current time, these are in-person functions, but I'm thinking that we're probably going to be working on figuring out a way to take those, some of those things online. Um, we have a, a, a lot of uh, language story times. We have people coming from across the county to attend those. And I'm thinking perhaps we become more of a YouTube service model where anybody can do it at whatever time. So I think that's um, really great trend that we're seeing. Also, I'm seeing a lot more with civic engagement, the, um, with the elections, with the census. How do we get people involved in their community in um, a way that they become a part of the community? So. Those are some of the things we've been working on and some of the things I've been noticing that have changed. Thank you so much. Melissa, how about you? Since you are in a very different situation than your typical academic or uh, public library, what kind of uh, service trends are you seeing? Uh, well, I mean, I think for like everyone else, we've all had, uh, we, we've all had sort of immediate trends in response to, uh, to COVID. Um, in that we've all had to quickly adjust to offering completely online services. Um, the Library of Parliament, we've got, we, we have beautiful facilities. We've always been um, very committed to our in-branch services. And now, um, and, and I don't think we would ever have considered closing branches if we didn't have to um, in order to keep people safe. So, so things that we would never have considered moving online five years ago, we now, we now have online. So like everyone else, um, that's really sped up our, uh, uh, our lead or shorten our lead time. Um, we have to move faster. We have to have uh, you know figure out how to involve more innovative technologies uh, in our processes earlier. Um, but in terms of service trends, um, there are some trends for us that have been going on for several years, and a lot of these probably um, other library types have experienced as well. And that's a lot more emphasis on making sure that we are um, representing um, you know underserved, underrepresented populations, minority voices, uh, making sure that uh, that that. Um, indigenous uh, communities have uh, you know, have representation in our collections, uh, making sure there are opportunities for uh, minority workers um, in our in our workplaces, uh, making sure that these that that um, the impacts for these groups are are included in our research publications uh, within the, the the federal government context in Canada, Parliament government agencies. Um, in a, the last couple of years, there's been a lot of um, emphasis on uh, gender-based analysis. Uh, which is include which 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 really is beyond um, simply um, you know gender. It also includes um, you know gender identity, racialized groups, um, different groups, um, you know different socioeconomic levels. So we have seen more more diversity in the types of products that we're offering, and I think this is going to continue um, you know well beyond the current uh, you know the current COVID situation. Um, but I also think that this situation has taught us how agile we can be. Um, and how much more innovative we can be. Um, and, it's, and I think it will open the door to a lot more experimentation across library types as we, you know, as, as we gain confidence from these experiments and from these, these projects that we're launching that have, that have gone well. Thank you so much. And Amanda, how about you? What kind of, kinds of service trends are you seeing these days? Yes, I would agree with what um, my colleagues have mentioned previously. But also, um, this isn't perhaps a new trend, but it's as important, if not more important, but thoughtful uh, collaborations and partnerships. So I'm within an academic library context and we're constantly thinking about what units we need to be partnering with and what does partnership look like um, in that particular setting. Um, sorry, I just lost my train of thought there for a moment. I was talking about collaborations and about partnerships. 
And this is happening across uh, our university library system. Um, also, in terms of academic libraries, we've been thinking about um, the value of academic libraries for about a decade now with the release of that report in 2010. So thinking about what kinds of data we're gathering in libraries and being able to use that data to tell our story, as well as inform the decisions that we're making about our services. So for instance, at Ohio State right now, my group has been charged with rethinking our reference service point, and we had a very traditional reference service point, and we'll continue to offer reference services, but we're trying to translate that into um, a larger concept related to student learning and student success. And what is it about university libraries and the expertise that we offer that can contribute to the overall student learning and success endeavor? So really think, rethinking the ways in which we talk about our services, even internally, I think um, is making a big difference in the ways in which we partner and tell our stories. Uh, also in terms of partnerships, that's a great way not only to promote awareness about what uh, expertise, services, and collections libraries have to offer, but it's a, a great way to understand what the needs are of various units on campus and uh, the types of conversations that they're having uh, that you might be able to contribute to. Thank you so much, everyone. So again, just to sort of wrap uh, up what everybody's saying and sort of put a little bit of a bow on it, I guess you can say, we're seeing a lot of experimentation and focus on agility to try and, uh, as um, Daphne very nicely said, grow up um, these experimental services into core services because we don't know what um, the services will be in the future and so we have to um, explore, which was nicely highlighted by Mary's focus on education, that that wasn't necessarily a core purpose, you know, uh, 20, 30, or, you know, 50 years ago, um, but is, is certainly a core service now. We also heard uh, a lot about what will sort of you know, give us a bit of a preview for the next question around technology, which is the importance of technology when it comes to service provision, such as YouTube um, services, whether it's uh, having a story time or programming on YouTube, or looking at digitization and scanning and maker spaces, which was a lovely example, Kelvin, um, of you know, taking this stuff and, and, and making it useful for the community in many ways. So that brings us to our next question. And I'm not gonna be surprised to hear uh, some of the same uh, trends being uh, talked about in this one, but I also think it's important to really highlight um, technology trends in libraries these days because they are increasingly more important. So Amanda, what kind of technology trends are you seeing in your libraries? Sure. So I think uh, libraries have been concerned about user privacy for a really long time. That's really one of the hallmarks of our profession. But in the digital environment, for me anyway, I think it's really easy to kind of put uh, user privacy to our IT teams and think that that's something that somebody else is going to handle. But um, as we increasingly interact with users through technology, I think that's something that we all need to have a baseline understanding of. And even more than that, data security. Um, because I know that I'm in meetings quite frankly, in, uh, or uh, I'm in meetings quite a bit now and people ask me, oh, you're from the library, so you must know a lot about privacy and security. And I'm suddenly put in the position where I need to be an expert on that, even though I don't feel like I am. Also in terms of technology implementation, accessibility is a, a really big issue. One that I'm not sure um, some of us are better than others at keeping that in the fronts of our minds as we are implementing technology. And so, um, what is accessible to one user may not be accessible to another. And so we need to be really thoughtful about how we implement technology and make sure we have alternatives uh, for our users to be able to access the services and collections um, that we're offering um, in a digital environment. Um, finally, uh, how do we use technology, especially in our current disrupted state, to meet users' needs in a virtual environment, both in a synchronous and asynchronous way? Um, so everybody's lives are disrupted right now. People aren't necessarily working on normal schedules, but they're still going to need support from the libraries. So how do we manage technology appropriately to continue to be able to meet their needs? Thank you so much. Melissa, how about you? What kind of tech trends are you seeing? I, I, I would agree that um, information security and privacy are going to be very important. I mean, 
uh, within, within the current context of COVID, everyone switching to telework um, has meant that a lot of the processes that we had internally, that, that a lot of libraries had internally that were still paper-based, that relied on you know, handoffs and, and signatures for approval have suddenly been you know, switched to um, online processes. So automation in libraries is not new. Uh, we've, had, we've, we've, we've been doing this for decades. Our integrated library systems have, um, they have modules that allow you to move all the way from initial user request all the way to you know, deselection um, using, using um, automated steps. But these other units, you know, e human resources units, um, you know, financial and, and acquisitions approvals that have not, um, not normally taken place within these systems are now moving online. Um, so that creates, it creates major projects for staff, um, but it also has major information management implications um, beyond uh, privacy and security. Uh, there's a lot of decision making going on right now by email, uh, by virtual meeting. Um, so I, for any of your students who are, who are looking at um, doing information management focused degree, doing archives focused degrees, there's going to be some new challenges looking at how information is recorded making sure that these systems are put in place with all of the, the functionality and features that are needed to support um, information throughout the life cycle for your organizations. That's going to be important. Um, making sure that staff are aware of, you know, the importance of, of you know, accuracy, currency, version control when they're, when they're working with these in these um, now completely electronic environments, work, work environments. Um, on the front end, uh, we're seeing a lot more, you know, a lot more delivery tools than we had before. I, I think we've, we've, we've talked about, um, you know, producing videos for clients. We've talked about, you know, more online, more online teaching and training. Um, so any of these, uh, we have a lot of, you know, social media has been around for a while. We've been talking about our, our presence on social media for a while, but that presence might change now uh, as people are interacting with these, with these networks differently. So there's, there's a front end and a back end that are going on right now. Uh, where there's going to be a lot of, you know, not just implementation, but a lot of a lot of policy work, a lot of a lot of thinking about these implications for our for our libraries and where we want to position ourselves, um, both internally and within our communities. Thank you so much, Melissa. So, Mary, uh, how about you? What kind of technology trends are you seeing? I'm seeing the technology become far more user friendly for our patrons, and um, also, far more self-serve. Patrons can be booking their own meeting rooms, they're downloading their books, um, they're checking out their hotspots, they're doing their own scanning. So I see a lot of that happening. Um, I'm seeing better discovery systems, which is great when we're spending millions on resources, we need it to get into the hands of our patrons. So whatever we can do to make that more available and more easily available, I think is to the good. One thing I'm seeing, which I'm not sure how to reconcile with the move to digital is I'm hearing a lot when I'm in children's services, I'm hearing a lot from parents that they are limiting their kids screen time. And as we go towards more digital resources, I'm wondering how that's going to play out. So I'm, I've been thinking about that and um, how we can make parents comfortable with our technologies and what we're doing in the digital realm. But at the same time, um, be able to still offer a full array of uh, information, even if it is in a format that perhaps parents are a little nervous about. So I think those are some of the things I think we're gonna be talking about more and more. Yep, I suspect we are, especially those questions around screen time. Uh, Calvin, how about you? What kind of tech trends are you seeing? So some of the tech trends, and, and certainly we've covered a lot of the ones that are, are already happening, they've been happening in libraries. Um, some of the work that, that, that I've been focused on around virtual libraries for the past you know, 10 plus years has been about virtual library, our presence outside the physical building. And so what I believe we're gonna continuously see is the library being in multiple places. Like for example, here in Broward, we have put digital library services on our buses, for example. We have them at, at, at our airport. We have uh, even our library services at our, at our parks. Uh, as well as the seaport for people who are uh, taking cruises um, in the future anyway, when they start back doing that. Um, but what, what I 
what I also will say is that we, during this time, we've definitely seen that that need for the expansion of broadband access. Talked about earlier the digital um, the digital access, discovery, and delivery. Certainly, the broadband access is is key to that, and so that's kind of come. It's not necessarily a, a, a new trend. It's a it's an ongoing trend, and we've been experiencing it for a while. And that's making sure that people have the tools that they need to access the uh, the digital content, right? So, which will which which talks about then. Um, the education of our services. That's some, that's something that I've been hearing, um, you know, just rumors of we're seeing and, you know, more people streaming and um, digital uh, online learning. Um, and so really um, the current technology trend is going to be to make sure that people uh, know and understand how to use the tools as well as have that connectivity that they need, um, you know, if such a situation occurs again with another uh, another crisis. Fingers crossed that doesn't happen anytime too soon. Uh, Daphne, how about you? What kind of tech trends are you seeing? Uh, well, I don't know if anybody else was watching um, Saturday Night Live, but uh, I was, and there was this, this great moment where um, in, in one segment they said, well, I've got to go now. I, I have to go and get my laptop I borrowed from the library to homeschool my kids. <laughs> And, uh, and I thought, you know what, I wonder, um, I wonder how many people are thinking of the library as one of those foundational supports that they need to educate their children, to educate themselves, to keep themselves current with all of the, the skills that they may need for their career, to even choose a career. Um, when we think of technology trends, as, as we all know, and as, as has been said, Libraries provide a, a foundational support, which includes the tools to how to use those tools. And now in, in so many examples, um, there are libraries that are helping people create new content with those tools. And then the library then goes on to curate that content and share it. So it's this full spectrum of, of essential roles that the library is playing right now. I personally find it really interesting um, in, in terms of content creation that it's the best of times and it's the worst of times. And by that, I mean, when you think of podcasting, for example, um, a few years ago, uh, podcasting was, um, you know, it, there, were, there were some really popular programs like Serial and there were sort of the groundbreaking, um, you know, opening up of a, of a whole new type of format. What has happened since is everyone can make a, a podcast and it, and it feels like everyone is making a podcast <laughs> right now. So a new role for libraries in this, in this um, new digital environment is what libraries have always done. Help people find the gems, help people find um, the voices that need to be heard and to amplify them, help people sort through all of this, this content that's never been available before in so many different forms and ensure that people can, can find it, can use it, can, can use it to better themselves and to fulfill their, their own needs and their goals. Thank you so much. Uh, this is a sort of nicely wraps up a lot of the, the themes that I was hearing it, all of you talk about, which is in some ways that this idea of the traditional role of libraries is just being enhanced and extended by technology um, in some really fundamental ways, whether it's uh, curating, um, you know, new culture, new technology offerings and content, or, uh, you know, the library acting as this foundational support for learning moving forward. Forward, you know, uh, in in some ways, uh, as ties to what Kelvin was saying around infrastructure needs and support, uh, uh, you know, libraries focusing, or acting as an advocate for those basic kinds of information technology infrastructure needs, as opposed to just you know our previous inf information needs, as well as things like technology education, and even, you know, going back to core values like privacy and security and accessibility, all of these are sort of covered in these emerging technology trends. So thank you very much, all of you, for this. And this brings us to our next trend uh, question, which is, 
uh, around workforce trends. Um, some of you have talked about these, but in some ways, I suspect our students will be particularly keen to hear what you have to say about workforce trends. So Daphne, what kind of workforce trends are you seeing right now? Some of the workforce trends um, are a continuation, I think a continuation of what's been studied previously, and that is um, a somewhat um, unfortunate lack of individuals within the library profession that are interested in becoming managers and ultimately leaders of the organization. So there are opportunities for those that want to take on those former formal leadership roles. There's of course informal leadership opportunities available everywhere throughout libraries. That's, that's an essential skill. Um, but some of the trends that we're seeing is when libraries um, have openings for senior roles, they're often very difficult to fill. And uh, it, it's, it's both, I guess, an opportunity for those that, that really want to pursue those, um, those roles that have the, the accountability, the responsibility, um, all of the all of the things that are needed to guide our institutions collectively but um, it I guess I would try to make an appeal in terms of the trends um, to let's let's move that trend from largely um, a, a difficult recruitment area to one in which we have uh, a number of people coming forward with a number of really interesting backgrounds, perhaps people that haven't been working in libraries their entire careers, perhaps people that have, that have taken on a role in a library as a second career, or people that uh, just bring a, a wealth of experience or a perspective that isn't predominantly available in the library profession right now. Thank you. Kelvin, how about you? What kind of workforce trends are you seeing? So I'll just pick up where my colleague left off, <laughs> and that is um, those um, uh, looking at the requirements of our particular uh, job openings to identify if a, a degree librarian or some other individual with different skills should be brought on um, to our organization. Um, that's a particular area that we focused on is our community engagement area where we have sought out individuals who don't have library degrees and once they've joined the um, joined us here they then go on to pursue a library degree as well as you know bringing those other experiences for example sales skills uh, to our uh, to our organization and really being comfortable going out and being uh, more of an extrovert, I would say. Um, some um, other workforce trends that we've done, particularly here in, in Broward, and I know other libraries as well, is around social equity and equity, diversity, and inclusion, really being comfortable with uh, not only our workforce, but the customers and the, and the library patrons that we, that we serve. Um, which dovetails into something I mentioned earlier, which, which is the situational leadership, which is ident identifying different situations and how you handle those as a, as, as a leader. We went from calling our, um, one of our manager meetings, we went to start calling it a leaders meeting because that's really what we are trying to build here is, is leaders, either formal as well as uh, informal leaders, being accountable, to um, to everyone, uh, to our staff, to our customers, to the county, and another workforce trend that we've that we've been doing is looking at people who've been here for four months and then people who've been here for nine months and calling them. It's called a stay survey, and really looking at that data and analyzing the comments that people are making so that we can actually help. Um, make our workforce not only better, but keep people here, uh, not won't necessarily say happy, but keep people here, keep them growing, giving the, the tools uh, that, they, that they need and trying to identify issues early so that we can, uh, we can focus on them as an organization. Thank you. So Mary, what kind of workforce trends are you seeing? Well, I couldn't agree more with the focus on inclusion and uh, internal leadership opportunities that people may not 
care to pursue. I see that a lot. One thing I'm seeing a little bit more of too is a lot more labor unrest. And I think that's true across the country and probably maybe even more true now after we kind of come through this. Uh, I think we're going to be finding some difficult situations ahead in that regard. Also, I'm seeing more distant learning and training with uh, our employees, making sure everybody is kind of up to speed on certain basic skill levels, and that should be able to be an effective, cost-effective way of providing some of those skills. I think the library is often in all communities seen as a place of, uh, it's kind of a community leadership it plays a community leadership role, especially in terms of emergency operations. And, uh, you know, we have people sitting outside the library in their cars getting online. And it, they know the library is a place that they can find information or access. So I think we'll, we'll see a lot of that. And I think that we'll probably be dealing with possible possible layoffs in the future, which is probably not what anybody wants to hear, but I'm, I'm hearing that from various organizations that I'm associated with. That is uh, an important trend to pay attention to, for sure. Uh, Melissa, how about you? What kind of workforce trends are you seeing? Well, within, uh, within my sector, within my library in particular, um, we've been seeing a lot of, a lot of emphasis on, on uh, a healthy work for, a healthy workplace. Uh, which is uh, beyond, um, obviously, we, we, right now, a friend of mine's people thinking of COVID, but this really means uh, a workplace where people feel supported, uh, they feel safe, they feel like they have the opportunity to create some work-life balance, they have the opportunity to learn and develop. Um, this is something that we've, that's grown out of, um, out of the recognition that, that what makes our libraries great places in our communities, what helps us serve our, serve our users is, is our staff, having, having employees who are dedicated to the library, dedicating to this, dedicated to our service missions, you know, dedicated to, con you know, continuously learning and growing that, you know, our employees come to us with those, with those attributes, but we need to nurture them. Uh, we need to make sure that we aren't burning them out, that we're not, that we're providing them with support when they're running into difficult situations. Um, and this, and, and the global pandemic is creating difficult situation for people. So we're really seeing, um, you know, a need for, for leaders to step up and, and make sure that their employees feel supported. And we're seeing that um, in many libraries. Uh, but I think this is, is really, it's a larger trend that goes beyond you know, the current situation. It's really how you're structuring your whole organization, um, all of your policies, your procedures, whether you are uh, really incorporating um, inclusion and diversity into every aspect of your organization. Uh, you know, it, it's, it shouldn't just be a single policy. It should really be a part of your culture. Um, and so this is a trend that we're seeing that's really going to make the difference um, between, you know, retaining great employees and, and, and losing them. Thank you so much. Amanda, what are you seeing? Yes, I'm going to follow up on some threads that my colleagues have already mentioned. Just as we noted before how important inclusivity in terms of leadership is critical for having strong organizations. Um, that is also true for our workforce more broadly. And the fact remains that despite several decades of trying to diversify our workforce, librarianship, particularly in the United States, is overwhelmingly white. And we actually haven't moved the needle all that far in being more inclusive as a profession. And so what I've seen in the decade or so that I've been a librarian is, um, a lot more folks taking seriously the need to check our assumptions and practices that may be contributing to a less inclusive and less diverse workforce. So what does that mean? It means taking implicit bias seriously and being able to be reflective of yourself and what you may contribute to those processes. It's recognizing the privilege that you bring to the table and how your perspectives may be informed by that, but they may not be applicable to other folks who have not had the same experiences that you have or who don't look like you do um, or who don't speak the same languages that you do. And I think too, um, the con we still have a long way to go uh, uh, to actually achieve these goals, but I've also seen a lot more folks taking responsibility um, for diversifying the organization. So I think for a long time, organization and profession, 
for a long time, issues around diversity were kind of pushed on to our more diverse colleagues, those who had minoritized identities. It was their problem to solve. And that's one of the very many reasons why it's difficult to retain folks who don't necessarily present in the same way that I do. But I've seen a lot more folks who have realized that diversity issues aren't just the responsibility of our diverse colleagues, but this is something that we all have responsibility to change. And so I encourage you to start thinking now about how you might think about issues of equity, diversity, and social justice as a librarian and the work that you might need to do in order to help our profession achieve goals of becoming more inclusive and diverse. That has very real implications for the populations that we serve. Uh, when you don't see somebody who looks like you uh, working in a particular environment, it may signal that you don't belong there. So I think we really need to take that seriously. And I've been seeing more conversations related to that lately. For sure, Melissa, or Amanda, sorry, for sure. Uh, so just, a, again, a quick uh, pulling together of every, all of the different threads. And so a few things were mentioned. One was this sort of long standing lack of interest in leadership and management. And this seems to be taking place throughout different sectors. It doesn't, it, it's not unique to one particular area. Um, and it's certainly not unique, um, as was pointed out by Daphne at the beginning um, to the profession at large. There's quite a bit of research around that. Um, there was the, uh, the repeated idea around diversity, inclusion, and equity. Um, and this really focused a lot more on changing organizational cultures and taking the time to reflect um, on these topics, both at, you know, at the personal level, as well as at the organizational level, and then ultimately, ideally, at the professional level as well. And I saw this as being really tied to this other thread that was going through, which had to do with uh, creating healthy workplaces, so supporting and developing people, but also learning why people stay in the workforce, what is it th that they're interested in, which connects obviously, I think, to um, the growing trends in labor unrest and uh, fingers crossed it doesn't happen, but also layoffs as well. So there a lot of these things, I think, are very interconnected in terms of workforce trends. So thank you all for, for bringing them up. So let's move to uh, our next question, which is a slightly different focused one, which is what services will move down on the priority list or at the top of your list to drop? So what do you think is going away, in other words? Um, and let's start with Amanda. Well, in terms of our current environment, not really knowing uh, what the future holds, even in the short term, we're definitely focusing a lot of our attention on our services that can be offered remotely and less focus on services that cannot be. Um, or we're thinking about how we can uh, offer those remotely and what are some of the trade-offs in moving into a virtual environment, virtual and possibly asynchronous environment as well. Um, but for me, this is also evidence-based librarianship, and so it's important to be collecting data on the services that you're offering to understand um, how they're being used or not used, and that requires thoughtful data collection. Certainly something that I haven't figured out yet, but something that um, we're, we're always uh, working on. And um, for me, it's not simply um, the more traditional return on investment, but thinking more broadly about what sorts of services are taking a lot of energy and resources, but don't necessarily have a high payoff either for our users or for the libraries. So that's not to say that we wouldn't put time and energy into things that um, really have a lot of benefit, but for a small number of folks, but it has, the benefit has to be there in order to continue doing that. We have to see that bear out in the data. So I think, um, reviewing the data that we're collecting, making sure it's the appropriate data that we need to make decisions, and then determining about how to prioritize our energy and our resources based on what we're seeing in that data. Thank you. Melissa, how about you? What kinds of things are dropping off your service to-do list, so to speak? I, I, I would echo that right now it's a little too early to say. Uh, everything is in flux. Um, we're all really focused on, on, on kind of getting providing services during this, during this pandemic. Um, and from a reference perspective, a lot of our, our questions are really, are focused around this. Um, people wanting to figure out 
what to do in response to this, how to access services where they can get the help they need to, uh, to receive benefits, um, to find jobs. Um, but I do want to speak a little bit about our, our print collections. I, I think sort of we, we, the, the flip side of the success story of, of virtual is that some people are, are kind of thinking, well, maybe we don't need print. Maybe we don't need our physical spaces. And I would say that this has actually proved that that's not the case. Um, you know, my, my reference team does amazing work with, you know, with, our, with our electronic resource collection, but we still face questions where we know, we know the book <laughs> that would answer our question. We know um, that we, we have questions that involve historical materials uh, that we cannot access right now uh, because we're not able to get to our branches. Uh, and there's always going to be, a, there's always going to be a need for our, our, our print resources. So, I mean, we do have some, you know, there are some projects that can come out of this. We do have um, digitization initiatives going on uh, for, you know, for publications that we, that we control, you know, copyright of. We can certainly get into to more digitizing, uh, making sure that they're more accessible online. Um, but there's always going to be a need for, for physical collections. There are some things that we're just never going to be able to digitize. Um, there are some physical, tangible objects that we're never going to be able to digitize that we need to make sure uh, are still accessible. Our branches remain accessible. I think once people are able to, um, to, to move about, go into public spaces, our, our spaces are going to become very important to our communities. Um, so it's, it's just important to remember that just because we're, we're emphasizing, we, we need to emphasize um, electronic right now, it doesn't mean that, that print and physical spaces uh, and paper resources are, are done or that they're not going to be a priority going forward. Thank you. Mary, what kinds of things that do you think might be dropping uh, down the priority list in terms of services? This is always kind of a funny question because, you know, you don't want to let go of anything. But um, I have to agree with Melissa. I think the, um, the format issue in terms of acquisitions is something that we're going to have to look at. Um, you know, recent research has come out that mentions that people are kind of going away from ebooks, which is ironic because that's where we're going. So um, we'll have to, and, and that's also, we, you know, still purchase CDs and DVDs. So what, what, what's going to happen with that? I suspect those um, acquisitions will go down. Also, I see reference services becoming less, um, less, at least in-person reference becoming less critical. And I have to say, I think those are the two that I'm most aware of at this point in time. Thank you. How about you, Kelvin? What kind of uh, services are you seeing moving down the priority list? So as, as mentioned before, this is a, definitely a hard question to answer. Um, so, but I would agree it's not really um, necessarily maybe moving things down the priority list, but really assessing the services that, that we have overall at, at this point. Um, we uh, are in the process of, of duplicating different programs that we have presented in, in, in person. We're going to continue those in person, uh, that, that programming, but move to, um, you know, online. We're going to need to assess, do some, you know, the, the, do some data analysis. I, I would say one of the, one of the uh, services that we were uh, anticipating, uh, I guess, changing was, the, um, was our public PC usage. Uh, we had noticed for, for years the trends have been in public library that because people have devices that that was going down public PC usage. So we were in the midst of uh, of a plan to reduce um, that uh, that public PC footprint. But now um, that has changed the, our thinking because we are expecting that when we open our doors again, that people are going to be in the libraries. More people are going to be in the libraries using the public PCs. Um, especially implementing phys more physical distancing, uh, applying for jobs, applying for unemployment, resume writing, um, and just needing that that access to our to our PCs. Um, during this during this time, um, we had actually just moved to a new integrated library system at the end of February. So we've been taking this opportunity to really to do a physical inventory of our two million of two million items that we have physically. And so this has kind of given us an opportunity to do that. We look at our physical space um, because we see people coming um, probably within the next week. We're going to be reopening. Uh, and so I'm already working on a, I have a reopening plan 
that we've already developed in trying to phase those services back in and do analysis uh, at, the, at the same time. Wow, best of luck with the opening. <laughs> That's amazing. Uh, Daphne, uh, how about you? What kind of uh, uh, services are you seeing uh, moving or even just changing? Because I think that's actually probably a more accurate description of what people are talking about. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, I'll pick up on that, um, on that point. I don't see uh, necessarily services moving up or down in terms of what we're delivering. I think it's the how. So what we're delivering will still always be in line with our mandate. So if public libraries have a mandate to connect people with information to help people fulfill their, their highest potential, um, to create strong and resilient communities, we'll continue to do those things. It's just how we do them. I think that's what's, what's changing. Right now, of course, um, there's, there's no better example than all of the, the diversion and deliberate investment to online digital services. But we realize when we do that, that we're leaving a lot of people behind. So I'm, I was fascinated by what Kelvin was saying, um, preparing to reopen and to look at what will libraries look like in this new context um, of physical distance um, that's required and how people will even feel about physical objects. Um, all of that is, is really in flux, but even though how we may process materials or circulate materials or design our interior spaces, given local context, uh, I think what won't change and what will never move down the priority list is the sense that the library is the center for human potential. It's the place where people can count on us and whether that's a physical space, if we're able to offer that, or if it is a virtual space where we are open anytime, all the time. Thank you so much for all of this. Um, I really love that this actually ended up being a very difficult question to answer for all of you, uh, not just because of COVID, but also because of this idea that um, the mandate of libraries in some ways hasn't really changed. It's really about delivering that mandate and the different ways to do that. So thank you all very much for these very thoughtful answers. Now we're going to move on to our last question and we only have a few minutes left to really address it. So. Um, uh, just to keep that in mind as we go forward. And let's, we'll start with Daphne, which is what should new MLIS graduates know about the trends you are seeing? I think new graduates should know that they're entering a, a world that really desperately needs their expertise, their creativity, their dedication, their passion. They're entering work uh, that is valuable, it's life-changing, and that the passion that is driving them currently in their studies is exactly what is needed when they go out into the community and they're able to take those needs and translate them into services, into things that, um, that ultimately make life worth living. So I, I would say the trends that we're seeing is um, there will always be a need for those individuals that know they can make a difference can inspire those that are working around them, can support those that are working around them, and that will always be receptive to the ideas, perhaps the constructive criticism, certainly, and uh, will have high degrees of self-awareness to know when it is their time to step back and when it is time to let others go forward. That is a really lovely sentiment. Thank you, Daphne. Kelvin, uh, what kind of things do you think our graduates should know about these trends? It's hard to follow Daphne, but I'll say that uh, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll pick up on what she left off and just additional comments would be for uh, MIS graduates to know about uh, continually taking the opportunity to learn something every day and how to quickly uh, pivot and be flexible and also work to implement, right? Because that timing of all of what's been happening, you know, libraries have taken the opportunity to lead. We've been able to implement. We were able to pivot and, and have some flexibility and not sit around 
five months later and still be talking about how we're going to do it, but actually being able to do it. And that goes along with just some decision making um, processes and, you know, making a decision and again, learning from it and, and, and adapting uh, because that's what, you know, um, we've been doing is adapting to these this situation and the situations in the context of our organizations each and every day. Thank you so much. Mary, what kind of things do you think our graduates should know about the trends you're seeing? One of the things I think about is how librarianship is still perceived as a profession of introverts to some extent. And I think that has to be left behind. If you're a new graduate, I think you're gonna be collaborating with all sorts of groups internally and externally, I think you need to have um, presentation skills and marketing skills, and you need to be able to do some teaching. So we, uh, we ask a lot of our new grads, but I think it's really rewarding in the library profession, and I think it's a great opportunity for them to grow. Mary, you win the award for connecting that answer to the outcomes of Info 204. Congratulations. <laughs> <Thank you>. um, <laughs> Melissa, uh, what kinds of uh, things do you think our MLIS graduates should see, or should see in regards to these trends, or, or should know in regards? Well, I, first I would say don't be discouraged. Uh, for anyone who's graduating right now, it can be a little daunting what, to graduate during a time of, of economic downturn. And so I'm sure there are a lot of people who are worried about their, their job prospects. And I would say um, a lot of libraries are hiring. We're going to be putting up a poster for our, for our anticipatory pool uh, in the next couple of weeks. I'm sure a lot of other libraries are. Your skills are needed. Uh, your experience taking online courses, working in virtual teams is very relevant right now. Uh, you have, there are leadership opportunities in our, in our profession. There are, there are jobs out there. And I know it can feel right now like, like it's gonna be a very, a very hard road to get to that first position post-graduation, but you'll get there. You have the skills you need, promote, your, you know, promote yourself. Um, you know, have confidence in the, in the skills that you've acquired in your program. Thank you. Yeah, I suspect a lot of people are feeling discouraged right now and they, they really need to hear that there are people are still hiring and that they do still have the, the skills they need. Thank you so much for that. And Amanda, last word goes to you. What do you think new MLIS graduates should know about the trend? One theme I think that has come up for me today, and I think Daphne put it really well, is that our, our mandates in many ways haven't changed. Our core professional values have endured over time, which is a positive thing. I think we'll see that continue. We have solid foundations, but the ways in which we approach those core values and those mandates are going to constantly be changing throughout your career. So I've been a librarian for not quite 15 uh, years and things I, I don't think I've ever gotten comfortable in the profession. We're always thinking about new ways in order to serve our users and, and meet those needs. And to riff on some of what my other colleagues have mentioned, that includes learning daily, like what uh, Kelvin said. That includes, if you are an intro introvert, I have some introvert tendencies, I'm very much a homebody, but being aware of those and understanding how you can draw energy in order to knock on other people's doors and create those uh, collaborations and partnerships and work with your supervisor, work with your colleagues to take some calculated risks and pilot some new experimental services and programs. So as long as you expect not to become too comfortable in doing things a particular way, um, I think librarianship will be um, very exciting for you and very dynamic and a rewarding career. Thank you so much. And so that brings us to the end of our webinar today. And I want to thank all of you for being here and for sharing your ideas. Uh, you shared some wonderful insights into what's currently going on. Um, and I think our students will greatly benefit from it. So thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.